going to work with Julie and I. Uh, one of us will be speaking, the other one will be managing the chat, and then we'll switch off. So you're going to see a little bit of both of us. Um, but drop any question you have in the chat. We are uh, we need that kind of interaction. If ask your questions, we'll try and answer it on the screen. So I hope everyone's having a great week. So let's get started. So this is a little bit about what our session is. We're going to help sort of set the stage to prepare you for government contracts. How you um, create that collateral that you're going to use for marketing to these government entities. And some mistakes that you can possibly make along the way that's going to kind of cost you that opportunity. What we're not going to do today is this is not a hands on workshop. We're going to walk you through, we're going to give you all of the information. And of course, our, our disclaimer on every one we do this will not guarantee you a government contract. So kind of what do you expect from us? We are very energetic and um, passionate passionate about what we do. We want uh, some interaction from you. You're going to hear from us. We're going to have this engagement. We're going to give you tools that you can use starting now to kind of help you put your capability statement, kind of help you find opportunities. We have plenty of time for questions. We kind of manage that chat so that, that there's plenty of time for Q&A. And what we expect from you is to listen, participate, take these ideas and out for a test drive, to tell us what you think, provide us those feedback, and you know, let us know what is working. We want to help celebrate your successes. All right, Julie. So opportunity, that's what this whole space is about. And as a small business in trying to go after government contracting, there are a ton of opportunities. And I think that's part of the reason why Susan and I are so passionate about this, because it helps level the playing field. And as a small business, you have, I think, even more opportunities than than prime contractors. But the one thing that I really like about the word opportunity is if you rearrange a few letters around there, it gets to the word you. And you, each and every one of you is in control of your own destiny. And that's what's really, really even more exciting uh, about that. And so you being here today is really starting that roadmap for success. In our 90 minutes, we're gonna discuss a few things. And they're going to be very digestible. Uh, what is a capability statement? Um, maximizing your marketing efforts, right? Once you have that, now what do I do? Uh, competitive research and then next steps, because it doesn't stop today. But the ultimate goal of our 90 minutes is to get you out there and get work, whether that's an informal opportunity or a formal opportunity or uh, work with a prime or a sub. So grab a sheet of paper, grab um, your notepad or whatever you've got and, and, and create an action plan. And this is going to help you take the things from today and put them in digestible chunks, right? So things to do this week. I know we've got a few days left next week, next month, and, and as well as um, next quarter. quarter. And Leon, I have you muted. Oh, it's Raphael. Okay, I just muted you, Raphael. Sorry, Leon. I saw. Um, and, and like Susan said, you know, we've got a fairly small group today. So please, um, if, if you need to be unmuted, um, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask questions. We really, really want this to be as interactive and in, as gauging interactive and engaging as possible. So a little bit about me. Um, I used to be a business owner. I had a business for 17 years and recently sold it. I grew my business through government contracts. We did marketing for the Department of Defense. We did marketing for the University of Houston, the state of Texas, city of Houston, all of these different government agencies. And 
part of, as I grew, I grew the business and became a certified proposal manager and helped other businesses secure government contracts. So in the last 20 years, I've helped people get $4.5 billion worth of work in the government sector. So not only did I start as that little girl from in my suit from Bells with my laptop that I think weighed 20 pounds back then with my capability statements, but everything that Susan and I are sharing with you is practical experience. It's not like we just opened up a book last week and said, hey, you know, we can regurgitate this. These are things that we've learned along the way, as well as things from our alliances, our partnerships, and our relationships with all these different government entities. Um, and I'm going back to school. So, you know, learning and education doesn't stop. And um, I'm in my second year of my executive MBA at Texas A&M. Here's a little bit about Susan. She's one of my favorite people on the planet. And Susan and I met over 20 years ago when she certified my company as a woman-owned business. So we've we've traveled this journey together. Um, we've celebrated many successes together. And when her and I aren't working together like we've been for the last four years, she spends her time with her seven grandkids and does these amazing pancake breakfasts. Um, She's going to put in the chat all the different ways that y'all can connect with us on all of our social media, as well as our email addresses um, and our phone numbers. So we're going to go ahead and explain what a capability statement is. It is a company's resume. And if you could at this time put in the chat um, if you currently have a capability statement. Um, so kind of are able to gauge kind of where where everyone is in in their their journey. So just like each of us has a resume to go and get a job um, in the government space and even in the corporate sector, they want a capabilities statement. So it's 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 a company's resume and it's one page about your company and obviously its capabilities. But I really like it for a different reason because it really helps you articulate and communicate your business. And what I have found is a, it also helps the business owners refine their messaging, right? And this is exactly what we do. And these are the things that we don't do. So it also takes these different elements that, that you, are, you may or may not already have for your business. It takes your business plan, your business model, and what your focus is. And it puts them all together in one concise and compelling single page document that tells your story. We're gonna pause right now and, and ask, um, ask any questions, if you've got any questions so far. Is our volume good? Everybody can see the slides and hear us and everything's great, wonderful. All right, either y'all have not had enough coffee or you're doing a bunch of other stuff, all righty. Um, in, in the government space, as well as in the corporate space, there's these relationships and these two big players um, that are prime contractors and subcontractors. And so I think it's important to, to pause and, and define those because with your capability statement, you're going to be able to send that directly to the agency, whether that's the gov a government agency, whether that's Metro here or Fort Bend Independent School District or you're able to send it to a prime contractor to be a part of a larger contract. So this is kind of how that hierarchical relationship is set up. It's the agency, then the prime, and then a subcontractor. So here's just a basic example of, of, of that in, in, in the construction space. So you've got the agency, you'll have your general contractor, and probably as a project manager, you might have a painting and sheetrock guy, an electrical guy, or an HVAC guy or a gal, right? And so that's how, how, it, how it works. But to take that even further, who else wants your capability statement, right? So here are some examples of prime contractors. Kelly Services does staffing. Faith Group does IT staffing in the aviation space. Government entities, right, all the way from HISD all the way up to the Department of Defense will ask for a capability statement. Those corporations that are gonna ask for capability statements, 
H-E-B, United, ExxonMobil, Home Depot, Walmart, when you set up your vendor profiles, if that's the route that you want to take, they're all going to ask for that. We're noticing that industry organizations are also starting to ask for these as well when you set up and become a member and they'll attach them in their business directory. Funding sources, um, one particular funding source that, that we do quite a bit of work for, True Fund, they, they require that as a part of, of your package when you start that business banking relationship. And so the components, right? These, these elements, and that's what, what we're gonna spend the majority of our time together today. They're broken down into identity, services, operations, the why you, as well as experience. So those are gonna be our elements as we navigate through the rest of our time together. When you're marketing to government entities, they don't want a fancy brochure or pocket folder with all these inserts, right? When you use, when we used to meet face-to-face, -face. but even more annoying than that right now is when people say, well, just go to my website. That is the last thing that they want to do. They either want a business card because some of them are starting to meet face-to-face -face again, or they want a capability statement. That's it. Um, and the great thing about a capability statement is you're able to email it to them. So the objective here is, A, get them what they need and how they want it, as well as ways to make their job easier. Because you might be interacting or meeting with the supplier diversity person at HISD. Then Yesenia is going to go back and then she's going to forward your capability statement to the respective buyer. Right. And so you want to make it easier on them. And then that helps not only the entity, but the buyer hit their small business woman minority goal levels um, when they've got your information. A couple of things about the capability statement. These are the subcategories uh, that we're going to give you examples on. And we're also going to show visual examples of different industries that Susan and I have completed. And then as an added bonus for being here today, you get a 50% off coupon. So you could actually, $50. I'm sorry, 50, $50. I did that the other day too. Susan's correcting. She's like, don't be spending my money. Um, $50, not 50%, uh, $50 coupon. If you'd like for us to either help you with your capability statement or actually do it for you. So you actually get your money back uh, from today. All righty. Oops. Benefits of a capability statement. Um, just in summary for this opening uh, part of our session is they're pretty easy to, to create and update. If and when you do need to print them, they're very inexpensive to print, right? Just go to your Kinko's or Office Depot. I would not print them off of your home office inkjet printer. Uh, it needs to be kind of that next step up. And then, like I said, they can be sent electronically. And once you, you start growing and, and are able to get your, your, your first capability statement done or your first capability statement refined as your business scales and you build your capacity, then you can even do capability statements focused on a particular service or product offering by a specific industry. Or if you, know, you, you even build your sales force and your business development team, you could have one for the owner as well as one uh, for your BD team. And we're going to switch and Susan's going to come over and take this next session. And um, I'm going to go do the chat. And as we do that, if you have any questions, open up your mic or put them in the chat. All right. And we're going to, you know, because Julie said, we, we're, we're, it's our first switching spot here. So we're going to move right into the actual elements of this capability statement. And we're going to start out with the most obvious, the identity. Which, strangely enough, when we're reviewing capability statements for people, that is the one item they have left off their capability statement, or it is so small and tiny and at the very bottom that it's hard to find. So you need to make sure that your contact information, you 
are one of the first things that they see. So this is Henry from, um, oh, what is Henry's company? 4.0. 4.0. And we've used Henry's headshot. Now there were a couple of reasons that we've done this for him. Um, one is he is the face of the company. He is the, actually he is the whole company as far as their whole process was designed around how he made himself a success as he went from high school to college. And so he's helping uh, students do that. So we put his headshot, he'd gone through um, a lot of interviews on TV and we wanted to make sure. We are actually doing this a lot more um, because buyers can't see people anymore. So this allows uh, that kind of face with the name. We have his address, um, his phone number, his email address, and all, all of his contact information. Now we're also seeing, hold on just a moment. Julie, could you let that person in? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's somebody hanging out in the waiting room. Um, we're seeing a lot of people not put their physical address because of COVID, or maybe they office out of their home. So that's something you need to consider, but you definitely want your website. Oh, sure. I need to let them in. Sure. I gotcha. <laughs> All right, sorry. Henry's contact, there we go. There we go. Um, so this gives you, you know, you have to kind of work, decide on that because you, you know, nowadays we don't want people just kind of popping into our office. All right, tax ID information. So you want you to list your federal tax ID. This, this shows this government entity. You have, you know, you've got all of your information. You are ready to do business as well as your DUNS number. Now, I am going, I've been registering a couple of people in SAM this week. And if you don't know what that is, that's a system of awards management for the federal government. One, if, if you're applying for your DUNS number, make sure that you put in your company name exactly as it is listed on your um, application for your federal tax ID number. They will kick it out if the comma is there before the LLC or not there, and it, it just becomes a whole nightmare. Um, so make sure you keep, every time you put your company name, you put it exactly like it's listed. All right, so your DUNS number, um, this shows that again, for that federal, um, if you're going after federal contracts, that you have your DUNS number um, and you want one for each sort of location of your business. Now with his, we did put his revenue. That is totally up to you of whether you wanna add your revenue. Um, companies that have been around a while and or, you know, they're, they're Revenue is to that point where you want to show that. Newer companies might not want to put that. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of those optional items. All right, if you do not have a DUNS number, Julie is going to drop in um, the website where you can get one. This is a free um, application to get your DUNS number. The DNB is going to want to get hold of you, call you, try and sell you something. You do not need to buy anything from them. This is free. Um, and again, make sure that your name is exactly as it is listed on your um, EIN information. All right, the last part of the identity section is your certifications. Now these are, we're gonna start out with your business certification. So you can list any national, state or local certifications that you have. You do not want to list any pending certifications. Make sure those certifications are current and they have not lapsed during the great COVID. 
Um, so here, Henry is certified as a MBE with the city of Houston. He is also a state of Texas historically underutilized business called Hub um, certified. So he has those listed on there. Uh, we have Casey. Um, oh, oh, we've at, we are adding now social media. So this is a great way for you to kind of give your um, that extra step. If you're going to list your business Facebook page or your business LinkedIn or your personal LinkedIn, make sure that it's updated and that it has information on it. So how many times I've gotten somebody's and I went, well, there's, you haven't posted anything since 2016 and no, we're not adding that. So here's, here's mine. So that is actually, um, has you know my headshot, all my information, as well as my social media. Is it? Yes. Yeah. There we go. So here's the certifications that you can get in the great state of Texas. You can be historically underutilized business, which is our state of Texas hub. You can be Texas Department of Transportation. Um, TxDOT will sometimes take HUB and then they sometimes take uh, their own certification or federal certification, depending on the source of the money. Um, oh, here we have Louisiana. If you're from Louisiana, New York, Georgia, Alabama. So there are certifications across the nation for the different states. So one question we get all the time, is there one place that you can go and get all the certifications that you need? No, <laughs> all the certification processes are slightly different. So here we have Phoenix um, Recovery Group. You can see they are hub. We have listed their hub certification number. They are also South Central Texas Regional Association certified as a ESBE, which is um, an HABE, an MBE, an SBE, an WBE, an ACDBE. So welcome to the alphabet. So some of the certifications that you can get for various cities, uh, City of Houston has their own certification, City of Austin has their own certification. Um, then we have, you know, Atlanta, Georgia, we have in Houston, we have Hire Houston First. We have New Orleans has their own certification process, as well as Savannah, Georgia. So again, every city that you um, are, if you're located in a city, you need to check and see if they have a specific certification for that city or that region. So here, here have, um, Umbrella Healthcare. This is a Louisiana certification. She is Hudson Initiative certified. So there are federal certifications. They have the SBA, the Hub Zone, which is different from Hub. We have SBA Woman Owned Small Business certification. We have SBA ED WOSB certification, which is economically disadvantaged woman owned small businesses. We have SB veteran owned small business. And then for um, doing business with large corporations, we have the National Minority Supplier Development Council, as well as Women's Business Enterprise National Council for women-owned companies. So you can get a, a large variety of certifications. You need to pick out the ones that best fit your company. So Honesty Construction Group, we have his certifications listed. Then his, um, he has several, he's also from the city of Houston. He's also Section 3 certified. He's also Hire Houston first and Metro. All right, did somebody have a question? No, not so far. Okay. Uh, 
I, I wish I could uh, stake a question on behalf of Prime, um, if I may. Um, okay. During any moment of the presentation, could we go back whenever possible to the cap capability statement? Is um, I, I did not hear too much about the capability statement. Is it related to? Is it related to the company potential? Um, is this our own examination as a company? Uh, your strength, um, experience projects. Yep, it's all about that. Yeah, right? it is. It's yes. all about okay. that. And, and we're getting, yeah, no, that, that those are great, great lead-ins, and we're we're getting to all of those. Absolutely. So you're you're about three steps ahead of us. Absolutely. Thank you. So these are just the different sections, and we're kind of winding our way through all of them. All right. So now let's talk about industry certifications. Because, um, you know, when we, in our world, when we think of certifications, we automatically go to those small business certifications. But if you have specific industry certifications, depending on the industry that you're in, then you want to list those as well. If you're a reseller, my, uh, um, maybe you're a QuickBooks certified advisor, uh, if you have Six Sigma certification, you're ISO um, cert certified, those are certifications that you want to list on your capability statement as well. And you can do that by either putting the words or, or you can use those logos um, to give that vis visual element. Um, so here we have MWA and we have listed all of his industry specific certifications that his company has. So you might carry specific brands, uh, Samsung, Dell, Nike. Uh, if you do have landscaping and equipment, you might um, carry the steel products. So all of, you know, again, that visual element that, that letting them know these are the brands that are, um, that my company provides. So here, um, so here we have turf equipment. There's, you know, they, we have all of their different um, industry brands that they carry. All right, any questions before we move to the next session section of our capability statement? All right, so we've covered all about the different ways to identify the company. Now we're going to talk about the specific services that your company offers. So can you remember this is who you are right now. One of the advantages of the capability statement is that you can update it as you add additional services or if you add um, or if you remove a service. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because you want to be very kind of narrow on what you put here. You don't want to be that person that's going to be, you know, I can do this, I can do this. Tell me what you need and I'll do it. This is what your company does. It's core strengths. So Wilson Unlimited provides engineering, consulting, project management, and subcontracting. Those are his high level, his buckets of services that he offers. And then we have it broken down to a little bit more specific um, services that he offers. He does construction management. He does uh, acoustical ceiling, stairwells, window installation, um, and all of these different services that kind of fall under those buckets that we listed. Now, government buyers like numbers, they like codes for the services that you offer. So there are two separate sets of codes that you're going to want to find out, you know, which ones fit your company. 
The first is your NAICS codes. Those are primarily used in federal contracting and primes that are have federal contracts. That's your North, a National Institute, no, that is your North American in, Institute. Yeah, that's your next coast. <laughs> That's what they're called. These numbers kind of tell those government buyers what you do. And this is also how you're going to find opportunities on a federal level. Um, and then you have your NIGP codes, which is your North uh, National, National Institute, Institute of Government, government Purchasing. Purchasing. The other one is the National Amer North American Industry Classification System. Whew. So here we have all of his codes listed. Here's a chef yo. She has all of her codes listed as well. But there's one thing that you need to kind of have uh, in sort of the back of your, your head. The codes actually have descriptions with them and you need to know what that description is. If somebody came up to you and said, you know, what is 722310? Uh, you need to be able to answer that uh, that means I'm a food service contractor. If you don't know what the code means, then they're just random numbers. Um, the buyer may know, but as you're handing this out, the um, hub coordinator or the business development person that you're handing it out to a prime, they may not know. So you need to be able to answer those questions. Have a little cheat sheet with you. All right, so we are going, if you don't know your NAICS codes, we're going to give you a website where you can find that. We will also be including in our follow-up email an Excel file where they are all listed. It's much easier to find them off that Excel file. You have two options here. And we will also um, send you the link to the NIGP codes. And this is for state and city um, opportunities. So these are the codes that you need to find opportunities for the state of Texas, as well as for the local cities. Um, and again, some primes, depending on if they're doing a state contract or a federal contract. Julie's gonna drop that link into the chat. And we will also follow that up with an Excel file of the 603 pages of, of NIGP codes. So another way to sort of identify the services is what industries are you currently doing business with? So Happy Teas has their industries listed. They do K through 12, they do sports leagues, they do higher education, government agencies, as well as nonprofits. So that is who they are currently doing business with. And one of these, um, you know, all of these examples have one thing in common. They are very focused on what they do. There is, you know, you take your core strengths and you put them on there. You do not have enough room to put everything you could possibly do or what you can partner with another company and do. These are your core strengths. All right, so Julie, I believe we're switching and she's going to go into operations. So our third element in the capability statement component is operations. And these are items that are specific, obviously, to your company's operations, just like Raphael said, you know, how do we put all of this, this, this together? So operational types of things that you want to address in your capability statements are in regards to geographic reach, possible office locations, warehouse, and plant, plant locations. So here's an example of a textile company. And it was very important for them to communicate when they were meeting with Delta Airlines that obviously they were located here in Houston, as well as you know, they, they can provide you know, napkins and, and all of the different types of textile services 
to Delta Airlines, um, you know, throughout uh, the U.S. as well as the world. But it was also equally important for them to illustrate where their mill locations were. So we put a, a visual there. Um, another example, which we feel is pretty relevant in this day and age. Um, so we've got accountants on the go. They're based in Louisiana, but their geographic reach is uh, Mississippi and Texas. However, she can do bookkeeping services virtually on a national level, but in person, she's limiting herself to Louisiana, Mississippi, um, and Texas. So think about your business, think about what you can do in person, or what maybe your possible crew size is and your capacity for that. Maybe you just want to start off inside the loop or inside the beltway, or maybe you want to do what I call as the Southwest Triangle, right? You know, Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, right? So you've got that Southwest Triangle. Um, or those types of things, right? And those are where and what can you do right now? Uh, here's an example of a survey in architectural and en engineering firm. Their corporate headquarters are out of Longview. However, they have smaller offices located in Bossier City as well as in College Station. So they are very, I mean, if you could draw a line, you know, on, on you know, the latitude, they are pretty much in that range all the way from College Station all the way over to Bossier City, kind of the, the Southwest, you know, Texas, Louisiana area. Um, we are halfway done with three of the five elements of a capability statement. Does anyone have any questions? Maybe they'd like to unmute and, and ask a question or uh, put it in the chat and Susan's over there. I can see your fingers going. <laughs> Alrighty, one of my favorite components of a capability statement is the why you. Why would someone want to do business with you and most importantly, with your company? And this goes to the value proposition. And it goes back uh, to a question that was asked earlier is how many pages you know, should your capability statement be? And it's one page, right? It really forces you to be clear, concise, and compelling. So every inch, every millimeter of space on your capability statement counts. And I love on a value proposition, this is a way for you to, to communicate the true passion that you have for your company, for your industry. And so here's an example of um, an engineering firm's value proposition. And so we've got it chunked. Yes, it is a paragraph, but we've separated the sentences. So it is much, much easier to read. What is a value proposition? Well, a value proposition is a very clear understanding of exactly what products and services your business offers. Back to that slide that Susan had on focus, right? Um, we've been on Zoom calls. We've stood next to people when we used to do people events and a conversation went something like this. Hi, I'm Susie and my company is XYZ. Then the agency says, Susie, what do you do? And she goes, well, what do you guys need? Well, Susie, what does your company do? Well, we can do anything. What, what, what do you guys need? That is so annoying for a corporation, a corporate supplier diversity person, or a, a procurement buyer. Um, it's like that, that awkward you know, date. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? It doesn't matter. Where do you want to eat? No, we've got to get to the point. Every minute, every second counts. And so your value proposition is a great way to communicate the benefits and the advantages that the customer gets with working with you and your company. So really focus on those, the benefits and the advantages, not, not the features. So if you don't have a value proposition, here's, here's some ways to kind of start getting that going. Um, know who your competitors are, go to their website um, and look. Um, and think about why someone would want to use you versus your competitor. Maybe that's that's all about you because your business just started. And that's fine, too. And it's all of the years of experience that it took you to get to this point to open up your business or to be a business development person representing someone else's business. You've got that industry knowledge. Try not to use buzzwords or industry jargon. People can see straight through that. And so to help kind of weed through some of that, 
ask yourself, what is one thing that happily surprises people about my business or about our business, right? When clients work with me, they discover X, Y, and Z. Um, my company goes above and beyond when it comes to. And, and if you're still having a hard time kind of coming up with those words, then call up one of your clients, call up somebody that's doing that you're doing business with or have done business with and say, hey, you know what? You guys hired us. We did this project. It was awesome. But but yes, we went and, and we poured concrete. But but what else did you get from us? How else did I make your job easier? How did we go above and beyond? And those that feedback and that information from your client definitely can help you craft your value proposition. So another thing that's not as fun and as sexy as a value proposition is risk mitigation, right? And that goes by insurance, right? And so you want to make sure that you have insurance. And regardless if you're a sub or a prime, you are going to need insurance. Now, the amount of insurance might vary and, and, and what is your risk mitigation strategy is going to vary, um, but everyone's going to need to need to have um, insurance. And so depending on what you do, your line of work obviously depends on the types of insurance coverage that you're going to need. And you're going to need to put this on the capability statement. Where do I find that out? Well, you will get a certificate of liability insurance or an LOI. And it, your, the sheet of paper looks just like that. So maybe this is one of the things that you put on your action plan is call my insurance agent. You know, I paid him back in January, but I really don't know what I have. Let them know that you want a LOI and not your entire policy. Your entire policy is going to be like hundreds of pages long. You just want this one pager, which tells you the types of insurance as well as the coverage that you're going to need. All righty. Um, most everybody's going to need general liability. If you were going to be going on a site, maybe you're doing a landscape contract, you're going to need auto um, insurance, right? Um, everyone is probably going to need to know, have some sort of an umbrella. Workers comp, do you have um, employees? Then you're going to need workers comp. Professional liability, this relates to the type of work that you're doing. If you're a CPA or bookkeeping firm, you're definitely going to need professional liability. If you're an architect or an engineering firm, absolutely. When I had my marketing agency, we had to have professional liability insurance, and that's errors and omissions, right? We are seeing more and more over probably the last two to three years, a requirement for cyber liability insurance. If you're doing IT consulting or some sort of um, contract that deals with um, confidential files that are going back and forth, or if you're going to, at some point within your contract, have access to information that that agency feels like you need cyber insurance. If you're in construction, then you possibly are going to need bonding. If that depends if you're going to be a prime or a subcontractor. So all these different types of insurances references, why you, I can sit here all day long and say how awesome Susan and I are or how awesome your company is. But if somebody else says it, it definitely carries a whole lot more weight. So you're going to need to put references on your capability statement. And all of this information that we're telling you to put on your capability statement that you're going to need to go grab from here and over here and send some emails, you're going to need all of this information as well. If you're going to get your certifications, you're going to need all of this very similar information for your vendor profiles that we're going to talk about here in a little bit as well. So save yourself some time and put it all in one thing, which is a capability statement. And then you've got that marketing piece, right? So be smart with your time. We recommend always having three references. And how do you get a reference or a testimonial? Well, you ask, right? You've just got to start somewhere. So you've got to ask. Well, before you ask, make sure that they were happy with you, right? Um, and that you left the projects on good terms if they would use you again. And, and a common misconception is, well, I'm, work, I'm working on a project with them. We haven't finished it. That's a reference. 
Absolutely, because that reference can talk about how did we onboard the project? What was it like? Did you follow all of the rules with the vendor setup process? Are you invoicing appropriately? What types of things have you done um, to make the, the contact person with that entity look better to their leadership? Have you been on time? Is your crew professional? Do, do you respond in a timely fashion? All of these different types of things a current client can, can talk about. So that gets us to this next slide about when you're asking somebody to be a reference or if you're asking for a specific letter of reference. And for your capability statement, you don't need a letter of, uh, of reference. You're just asking them, can I put you on your capability statement? But to, to get you a little bit more insight about you, your company, and why they're using you that could help you with your value proposition, as well as help you with your competitive advantages, say, you know, can I list you as a reference? Well, absolutely. Well, if someone calls or when someone calls, would you mind talking about the quality of work that we did? Would you mind talking about man, we had this challenge and, and, and remember that? No, it was horrible, but it rained for 12 days and we couldn't, you know, get the roof on. But, but our crew, we ended up working, you know, 10 days straight. I had a day crew and a night crew. And you know what? We still hit our deadline. Could you, would you mind talking about that? Would you be comfortable? You're not coaching, but what you are doing is helping that person give you a very good and specific reference or comments about the way that you do business versus, yep, they did a good job because everybody else can just say that. So once they've agreed to be your reference, make sure to follow up and follow through and thank them for not only your continued business, but also the support and helping you grow your capacity, helping you grow your business. And and just send an email, or if you wanted to, you know, get out a, a thank you card and, and, and handwrite them a, a note, um, because you want to make sure that your references know that you've got them on materials, and most importantly, that people will be calling. Susan is going to close us out on the last part of our components and our elements, which is experience. Susan forgot her glasses. All right, so now let's talk about the experience <clears throat> that your company has, um, you know, already done a great job at. So there are different ways, again, that you can um, have this information. Visual, if possible, if you can use their logos. Um, or you might want to just list them as a bullet point. So this shows the variety of entities that Texas Security Shredding has done business with. Across the bottom, we actually have um, logos from government entities, corporate entities, higher education, and oil and gas. So she's done business with all of these in the last three or four years. You ever into in a facility and you see a pink shred bucket, that is her pink shred bucket. You can also talk about um, sort of like what we call by the numbers. Numbers are a powerful statement. So Strat Homes has done, has been in business for nine years. They've done um eight new builds, but they've done a 178 remodels and they've completed seven commercial projects. So this kind of gives you a quick glance of the similar work that they've done and what their experience level is. Now, one of the um, questions that we get asked a lot is what if you're a new company? You can list the owner's experience as long as you clearly state this is previous experience. Um, so, you know, that, that is one of the, the main questions we get for brand new companies. Like I am brand new, we've not done any work yet, 
or very little work? And how can I, you know, but I've been in the industry for 20 something years and you can list that. You just need to clearly state that it is the owner's previous experience. So if your company is a part of these national purchasing corporations, whether it's the GSA for the federal, buy board, choice partners, TIPS, um, these are used a lot for um, different schools or different government entities that gives them um, better pricing this way. So you can list that there, that way that um, if you're marketing to one of those entities that accepts um, or is part of this national purchasing cooperative, they already know you're part of it. So additional information that you can you know, include is sort of industry organizations that you're a part of, um, especially if you're in leadership roles within those organizations. Um, if some specific uh, industries, certifications that the owner or team members have, and then any awards that your company has won. Um, so here's Advance Plus uh, Therapy. The owner has certifications. Oh, we skipped that one too fast. Um, has her certifications listed that she has gone through. In her industry, this is very important to know what certification she has. Um, and here we have uh, STC Financial Services and her industry involvement. Um, she's very uh, involved in a lot of different organizations. And so she wanted to make sure that, that she let people know that it's very important for her industry. So the awards, Noe here with MWA Architect has um, received the Outstanding Designs in American School and University. It's an architect, that's a big award that he wanted to let other government entities know that when he designed this particular building, that that received an award. So these are different types of elements that can be added to a capability statement. Um, and again, these are some of the optional items. Now, what happens if your company does a lot of different services? And you know, you're trying to keep it to one page. I think somebody said, you know what, this is gonna get pretty jumbled and pretty crowded. Well, one of the things that you can do is actually have multiple capability statements. So you can have one for different people within the organization. So as they're out handing it out, they have different contact information, or you can have it for your different services. So we have Johnson and Pace. We saw one of theirs earlier. So they have one that is specific to their land surveying services. And then they have one that showcases their retail experience as they're going out and marketing to that industry or if they're marketing the survey services. So they actually have several different capability statements. They're just a little bit different um, that it, as they market to those specific areas. All right, any questions? I know y'all have had some coffee. All right, so we're going to, we, we sort of finished all the different elements and we are now moving into, what do you do with this? All right, so I want everyone to kind of really, really get that pad and paper. We're going to be dropping some, some websites. We're gonna be dropping some information of what you're going to do with this piece of paper now that you're created it. Now what? And I'm going to talk about that. And Susan's going to finish my thought that I'm putting in the chat as I'm walking. Um, absolutely, she is. Um, what we're going to do also, we've, we've talked about these these goodies that you're going to get um, later today as a as a, a, a um, an attendee of of our session. And another thing that you're going to get is the actual chat. 
So Zoom allows us to, to download the whole chat. So you're going to get all of these links. You're going to get the, the public chat with the questions and then the answer as well as everyone else's um, contact information. The remainder of, of the session is going to be spent on what do I do with this? Now, now I think it was Julie asked, okay, what programs can I do to create it? Um, and once you've got it created, if you want to send it over to Susan and I, we can look at it for you. Or if you want us to create one for you, we can do that as well. Whatever works for you. Once you've got that, right, and I've got my imaginary capability statement in my hand, what do we do, right? How do I get the benefit of all of this time that I've spent putting all of this together? Well, we recommend narrow it down to your top five. And also this helps answer a question that was in the chat earlier about which certifications do I get? I have my hub in my city of Houston. Well, what certifications do your clients require? Because you could spend an enormous amount of time getting certifications and, and, and you know, have all of these plaques all on your wall or in your file folder or in your, in your computer of all every cert. But if it's not going to benefit you and if it's not a part of your business plan and your business focus, then you've just wasted a whole lot of time. So channel your inner Stephen Covey and, and really begin with the end in mind. Who do I want to do business with? And then reverse engineer out of that and see what certifications that they take, right? For example, the University of Houston is actually a state-funded agency. So the University of Houston, the only certification that they care about is HUB, which is the state of Texas. If you go and meet with the University of Houston buyer or you email up Dr. Clark and you start going, well, I got city of Houston and I got South Tarrant County and I got um, NMSDC, she's like, I, I don't care. Not that she doesn't care about you. She doesn't care about that certification. They don't accept that certification. Home Depot, right? If you want to do business with Home Depot, they accept two different types of certification which are national certifications, which is the NMSDC, which is for minorities, and the WBENC, which is for women owned, right? So if you want to do business with Home Depot, don't worry about the city of Austin, don't worry about the city of Houston or, or even Hub. So, so think about that. But all of these top five target clients are going to want your capability statement, right? Um, so once you've figured out your top five, and if anybody wants to share in their chat, if you already know which ones are your top five, or maybe you're, this has got you start thinking about you know, where you want to grow your business and the types of, of clients that you want, go ahead and share that. These four questions, who, what, when, and, and, and why? Who are the buyers, right? Who at Home Depot buys? Who at HISD buys? you know, graphic design services, who at the city of Conroe buys landscaping, right? What, what do they buy? And when do they buy it? And, and, and why, why do they want to do business with you? Well, that goes all the way back around to the value proposition that's on your capability statement, right? And the when, I'm going to circle back to that a, a bit. When, when is their fiscal year, right? Because I know it's August, but a lot of school districts have already started, obviously, their new fiscal year. A lot of government entities, the city of Houston, have already started their new fiscal year. We were on a call with Veronica Douglas at HCC, and she started out, she goes, hey, guys, I got my new budget. I got money. Let's go, right? S sign me up with Houston Community College, right? Um, All righty. The who and the what. Who are the buyers? What does each specific buyer buy? Well, in order to know some of that, we've got to visit and register on each specific vendor's website. I'm going to circle back again to that top five. You could spend weeks, weeks of your time registering on every different vendor database, Right, because if you want to do business with Shell, the Shell data vendor database doesn't talk to Home Depot and United's database doesn't talk to Home Depot and doesn't talk to Shell. The city of Houston's database doesn't talk to Bear Counties, it doesn't talk to the CMBL at Hub, that doesn't talk to the WBEA. So, back to really being laser focused and what does my business plan have? What is my, my, my strategy immediately as well as long term? And how does 
that company fit into that, which of which I want to do business with. All right. So we're going to take it from the top, um, just a little bit farther north is, is the city of Conroe. Well, to register at the city of Conroe, Susan's dropping this in, um, here you go. And it's free if you just want to see Conroe stuff, but this vendor registry platform, um, you know, obviously everybody wants to make a little money so you could upgrade to, to vendor and national. But if you just wanted to get city of Conroe, um, there you go. So now that you're registered, right, then you can start seeing different current proposals and bids. And so once you register and you put in your NAIX codes and your NIGP codes, they will send you opportunities that qualify for those NIGP and NAIX codes. Then you, you've got to head a, a lead into the game because as soon as it drops, you get notified versus having to go to the city of Conroe's website, which is here, which is their current proposals, right? So we went and got the screenshot this morning. So these are the proposals that are out in the street right now for Conroe. And so if you keep scrolling down, you can see some more, some more opportunities. But what I like about this site is here's the purchasing manager, and then here's the buyer and warehouse supervisor. So it's okay to call them up, introduce yourself. Then as a follow-up from the call, guess what you're gonna send them? your capability statement, right? But I strongly encourage you before you call up anybody with any entity, whether it's with the corporation or a government entity, be registered first, because that's what they're gonna ask you. Have you registered in our system? And you're gonna say yes. Then the conversation will continue. If you say no, they're gonna say, great, thanks, go ahead and register it. And, and, and call me when you're done with that, okay? So you're already ahead of the game. For our friends that are in the San Antonio area, Bear County, so this is the entire Bear County, right? And so their, their website obviously looks a little bit different than the city of Conroe. And this is their purchasing and procurement portal, which has obviously purchasing information. And then the portal, here's the supplier portal. Bear County Supplier Portal doesn't talk to Conroe's. It doesn't talk to the state of Texas. If you want to do business with Bear County, this is where you need to go. All righty, then we're going to move over um, to a little bit. And back to that, that tying these things together, tying these different elements together and connecting the dots. Bear County accepts two certifications, the Central Texas Regional Certification and the Hub. So if you want to do business with Bear County, don't start telling them about your city of Houston certification. They're going to say, get on I-10 and go down the road. All righty. Here's the Bear County that has um, open bids. So these are the different types of bids that are open right now in, in Bear County. And it says when the open date was, and this is the date that it dropped on the street, right? And then you've got your due date. So we've got some that are due on the 26th, the 27th some September the 10th, and then this nursing rooms countywide is due on October the 1st. All righty, we're going to just go up a little bit north on I-35 to the city of Austin. And so here's the city of Austin's purchasing department and talks about how they make different purchases based on the dollar amount. Back to your capability statement and back to the buyer. Great way to get experience and put that experience as you update your capability statement is informal opportunities. So the city of Austin, you know, a buyer at the city of Austin can just call you up and say, hey, I need, I need some work done for $2,500 because it's below the $3,000 limit. You don't have to go through this big procurement process and this RFP and all of that. They can just pick up the phone. Now, things between $3,000 and $5,000, they're going to need to get some quotes. So you're going to have to submit a price and somebody else is going to have to submit a price. Pardon me. And a third person is going to have to submit a price. But hey, you know what? Those checks cash the same exact way. So start small, know the systems, establish a relationship, and then you can grow your capacity throughout the government space, or if you wanted to specifically grow um, with the city of Austin. All right, a good friends at Metro, their, their um, SBDB contract compliance system 
is their screen is like this so you 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 know sign up for your account or you can find other competitors i don't know any other space other than government that i can go and look and see who else is playing in my sandbox who else is registered with metro who else is registered um with with the state of texas in the hub so now i get to see a very good competitive landscape if i wanted to do a swot analysis or some sort of a competitor analysis and see it's brilliant absolutely brilliant back to what we said in the beginning in terms of opportunities and 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 you there are tons and tons of opportunities our good friend yesenia at hisd um here's their website uh, their purchasing department um, as well as they use um, a platform called Ion Wave, asking all of the same types of information that are going to be on your capability statement. Susan's dropping it there. Um, Port Houston, Port Houston just launched a huge program that they are super excited about um, for small businesses, and and they've moved. Um, from their old system to buy speed. And so Susan's putting putting that information in there. Um, so if you're interested in port, but they, they've got lots of money um, and a huge commitment to, to, to Houston small businesses. Um, so we've kind of tried to give you a flavor of different types of, of entities, as well as the different locations of, of the entities um let us know if if there's a specific entity in your top five that you're having a problem finding this type of information for so you want to search per, search for purchasing you want to search for minority or sbe um let us know susan and i are um are definitely um here to help so now that we've back to we've got our capability statement and we've we've been registered as a vendor so now um the different types of opportunities and this is going to help tie in what we started with in the beginning regarding the prime and the sub um subcontractor relationship right so when and why do these entities buy your services right so our other two remaining w questions well let's call the buyers so here's hisd's purchasing department these people are motivated and super passionate to helping small businesses and back to those opportunities right we can't guarantee you a government contract but we can definitely get you to the door and and get you two or three steps a little bit farther than than other people right because here are the people who have to hit goals they have small business goals that they need to meet so you can help them hit their goals and they can help you by growing the capacity of your business and so it's listed by the different categories who that person is what their title is and their phone number call them up i'd like to do business with hisd i've already registered as a vendor i'd like to have a conversation about a b and c and those are the services that i provide or you could ask them, what are some services that you're having a hard time finding a vendor for? Maybe it's one of the services that you provide. Here's the city of Austin, right? So here's the procurement manager, the procurement specialist, the contracting manager, just like their counterparts at HISD. They have goals that they have to meet. They may need the specific services that you offer, or they're going to say, you know what, we do take that, and we've got this big RFP coming out, or you know what, I actually need a quote for A, B, and C. Can you send that over? You just never know. Um, but you've planted that seed, and maybe when the opportunity comes up, then, then you've got that there. Co-ops, co-ops obviously have opportunities there. And different co-ops work a little bit differently. Some have a have like a monthly fee or a yearly fee. Other co-ops will take a percentage of the contract once it's awarded. Do your research, ask Susan and I, and we can help you find the co-op that works best for you, fits best for your business model and your overall business strategy. Anticipated projects. 
We love our good friends over at Metro. They're giving you a heads up of these are the types of projects that we already have budgeted for the upcoming fiscal year. We'll go and look at that, look at what your business plan is, what your budget is, and maybe that might fit perfect with what you've got. But you can also contact that buyer before it hits the street and have open dialogue and open conversation about challenges that that buyer has, the types of needs that they need from providers like you. And that works with anticipated projects. Another thing that I love about the government space and back to opportunities and leveling the playing field for small businesses is bid tabulations. These are bids that have been won, and this is specifically for Metro as an example, and it'll tell you who won the contract, who their subcontractors were, and how much the contract was awarded for. It's a, a literal and figuratively figurative gold mine for, for you to help position your company in this space with those types of goods and services. It also gives you the contact of the prime. Because you can see all the references prices. Exactly. You are exactly right. You can see the prices and you can see um, how your prices fit with those prices. And I don't ever do anything um, where you're losing money, right? That, that's, that's not a good business model is, is, is to, to, to get a project to just have experience when you're losing money. Um, and, and, you know, when you take it from the entity's point of view, I don't want to get all of this onboarding for this vendor, start this relationship, get them going. And then in six months, they go out of business because they didn't price accordingly. And that's actually happened um, to a, to a um, um, we know that happened to a landscaping company as well as a um, vending machine company. They landed a huge contract with the school district here in, in the Houston area. And uh, what they did is they went and they looked at the bid tabulation and they took the incumbent's price and they just slashed it all 10%. They didn't look at their pricing and, and had to um, leave the contract because the business was actually going under fulfilling it because they didn't, they didn't sharpen their pencil and do all of the math. So use the bid tabulation, but then make sure that you open up your Excel file or sharpen your pencil and, and make sure that that makes good business sense for you to, to be able to compete at those prices. Uh, Metro puts out their current projects um, as well, just like everyone else. Um, and then here's a tips um, co-op as well. Um, Harris County, Harris County just did a disparity study and they are highly motivated to, to um, increase their small business spend. They accept hub certification as well. Um, our good friend Tico at Precinct 2 has lots of opportunities. Uh, for businesses as well. Um, so let us know. And this is Susan, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about the journey of, of, of your capability statement. So you've got your capability statement, you've done all of this research. Now, how do you get it to where it needs to go? Um, so let's kind of discuss that sort of that journey that it takes. So state coordinators, hub coordinators, we're going to send you a list of all the state of Texas hub coordinators, liaison officers, uh, federal government, they call them small business liaison officers. Large corporations have supplier diversity individuals. Prime contractors, it may be the project manager or the business development. All of those individuals on your top five, whatever their title is, needs to get a copy of that capability statement. It's all about purchasing, it's buyers. So how do you get it in their hands? Well, Hopefully, 
soon, you will be attending those conferences and those events. And you're actually going to walk around to the different booths and you're going to have a conversation with that person manning that booth about what your services are. Now, just drop it off or my favorite thing, having put together expos for many years, is people just walking around grabbing the goodies off the table. No, have a conversation with that buyer or that hub coordinator or that business development person that is manning that booth so that they remember you. Um, one on one meetings. Um, I know HMSDC is about to have their expo and they're going to have some one on one meetings scheduled for individuals to meet with those buyers. You want to make sure that you leave them a capability statement, much like you were interviewing for a position at their company and you would hand them your resume. Uh, Pre-bid meetings. Most of those are now virtual. Um, hopefully, again, we'll go back to actually face-to-face. -face. But if you attend a pre-bid meeting for, say, HISD or HCC, you will receive a list of those that attended that meeting that signed up. You want to follow up with them with your capability statement. This gives you an idea of who's going to be playing in the sandbox of this opportunity that you want to go after. It will tell you on that list whether they are, have the, whether they're a small business, whether they're certified, whether they are a hub, um, or whatever certification that entity accepts. If that company is not, that's a good partner for you to, to help subcontract. Help them meet their small business goals. There are education, educational programs that you can attend. And again, you want to pass out your capability statement. So you never know when you're going to partner with another business that's in that room. You're going to um, either do business for them or they do business for you if you go after a government contract and you need uh, small businesses to meet the goal. So all of these different types of events, but also look on the websites. We just gave you a list of all the different websites that actually list the buyers on those websites. So find the buyer that buys your goods and services, start a conversation with them, send them an email, hand them, give them your capability statement so they know who you are after you've registered on the website. You can actually put your capability statement on your website. So here we have Odyssey Construction. If you go to his website, you have the ability to download his capability statement. So you, as you send out these capability statements, I tell people you need to be patiently persistent. So if you've met them at an event, you're going to hand it to them, put it in their hand, and hope that it gets back to their office. Um, but you're going to follow it up with an email about a week after you've met them. Because you know, you've been to conferences, you bring all of your stuff back, and it's still in a bag in the back of your office or riding around in your car. So follow it up with an email. Hey, I met you at the event because they attend a lot of events. And maybe a little bit about something about the conversation that you had. Um, maybe y'all connected because your kids play soccer together or um, there was a connection because you all went to the same school. So make it a little personal note and Follow up with that capability statement. About a week after that, if you haven't heard anything back, maybe a phone call, just a nice little message to them. Um, you know, again, not just, hey, did you get my capability statement? You haven't returned my phone call. But just a nice, you know, hey, just wanted to, to connect with you. I sent the capability statement. I've signed up on your website. I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with you. Um, any communication that you're sending to anyone 
Um, have your capability statement. If it's on your website, have a link to your website. Or if you're sending any conversation you're having with the buyer, you can just send them five capability statement and you're emailing them about something else, attach it. Or if you updated it, hey, just wanted you to um, receive my most recent capability statement. We've added additional services that we want, wanted you to be aware about. So continue to, to follow up with them understand they attend a lot of events they met a lot of people so be patient be nice remember they're people and and treat them with respect all right so we do have um that fifty dollar fifty dollar off not fifty percent fifty dollars fifty dollars <laughs> um if you'd like to have a capability statement designed um or if you would just like us to review the current one that you have um those that's normally 150 dollars we'll do that for uh 100. um so all of this kind of information i know we've given you a lot of information there will also be information that's provided to you as a follow-up um along the sort of the, the 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 chat as well as the recording so you'll have all of that information as well that way you can go back and kind of review some of this all right, so I hope that you have started putting your action plan together. Does anyone want to share some of the items that they're going to be doing Friday? Because this is the end of the week or early next week. All right, does anyone have any questions about the information that we have covered today. Well, we needed to send everybody some coffee before we started today. All right, so we're gonna give you some items that you can put on your action plan. You want to sign up for the Julie and Susan YouTube channel. We have many different sessions on that channel. Um, get your house in order build uh, capacity building. So all of this information, um, we're going to see if you're in the Harris County area, Harris County and Lyft Fund have joined together and they have grant money. Grant money, that is- $30 million. $30 million of free money to the small businesses in the Harris County area. Julie is going to drop that link into the chat. Um, check that out. This is a great opportunity. The uh, applications don't open until sometime in September, but it gives you the information that you need to do, need to have put together before that application opens. Uh, connect with us on social media, kind of follow and see where we're going and what um, seminars that we're going to be. Uh, posting, and we will be sending a survey in the follow-up. So we please, please take a moment and fill that out. Now, on your sort of your next steps, you're going to start organizing all of the different elements to your capability statement, <clears throat> create that folder on your hard drive, start dropping in that information, maybe your client information that you want to list for references. Maybe you've gone out and found the logos of the organizations you want to put on there. Identify where those gaps are. Where are you missing information? What do you need to go? Have you not done your DENS number? Maybe you don't know your NIGP codes. And oh, that's one of the first things you need to do is you know what codes do your company fall under? You can't do government contracting without those numbers. Um, if you haven't um, completed a capability statement, go ahead and start laying that out. If you already have one, maybe it needs a refresh. Identify those top five so you know what certifications your company needs to get. Go ahead and register as a vendor. So you do not have to be certified to do business with any government entity. It is simply a way into that organization. Find an opportunity 
review that opportunity, review all of the information that they're requesting so you know what you need to do to actually respond, attend one of those pre bids doesn't matter if it's in your industry, just attend so you have some idea of what this process is. All right. Well, that wraps it up. Wow. <laughs> we covered a lot of information today. We have um, extra minutes left, obviously by design. Um, open up your microphone, ask, ask questions. We've got, this free consulting, so so maximize your opportunity here. Hold on, I can uh, see Raphael's trying to Raphael's talk. Raphael's just a talking. So yeah. go ahead. There you go. Do you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So far, uh, this past week, we were able to submit like four bids to DPS and several locations and the University of Houston. Wow. And we have, yeah, we have. I already did, did them last week, and uh, we did four, and um, we're waiting results. Um, but you have provided an outstanding way of putting the capability statement in one piece, but the, the, the bids request you to fraction your, your statement in several pieces, like like they, they would ask you for references apart, certifications apart, uh, information from the company apart. But it all relates to what you have said. If we would summarize all what we do in this statement, then it would give them a pretty good idea what your company does and the, the real mission of your company. So from my, from my side as a prime business manager. I highly appreciate your beautiful training today in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. And Rafael, you know, just like earlier when we started, you you, you might have ESP or something um, because you're leading us right into, um, we're doing actually a session in December with our dear friends at RFP School Watch. And Renee is, is here. Wave your, Renee's there. She's got her video on um, and they're hosting us um, December the 8th, we'll, we'll, um, as soon as the, uh, that information and registration is available, but we're going to walk you through an actual HISD bid from start to finish. And the great thing is, is let's say maybe HISD isn't on one of your top five. That's okay, because 60 to 70% of the bids that you do for HISD, you're going to need for the state of Texas. You're going to need for the Department of Defense. You're going to need. So, Back to kind of what Susan was saying is find an opportunity and just start going through. You've got to start start somewhere to un understand um, this this space. So we thank everyone for joining us today. And it was just a true pleasure and honor that you chose to spend 90 minutes of your day to better yourself and, and better your company.